Welcome back. We're looking at the USA seven years after the attacks of 9-11 and asking to what extent has the so-called war on terror and the demand for national security eroded civil liberties and values as well as individual rights. Joining me from London is leading constitutional scholar David Cole, whose new book is Justice at War, the Men and Ideas that Shape America's War on Terror. And in Washington, D.C. is Professor of International Law and Diplomacy, Ruth Wedgwood, who teaches at Johns Hopkins University. Now, we get back to our discussion. Prof uh, Professor Wedgwood, if I could put this to you, what uh, our caller Gabriel from Italy had asked before. He was asking, why is it so much money is being spent overseas in Iraq? The, the resources seem to have gone overseas while people in the U.S. still need help. And this is a knock-on effect, really, I guess, to what's happened with the war on terror. Well, I think what he's referring to is the story about the $89 billion that mm. Iraq has finally made from oil, right. which the U.S., to be fair is actually pressing the Iraqis to spend uh, so that our deficit shouldn't be quite so difficult as it is. Um, but the war was very expensive to Sh Shur and Bagora. You can't deny that. Uh, in, in, in a way, what he's really adverting to, I think, without saying it directly, is that the U.S. has borne the financial burden for most of the West uh, it, for many, many years. It, there was a NATO pledge to have a 2% GDP investment by NATO members reached at the Prague summit several years ago, and only five NATO countries have met that pledge. So you do have an inordinate burden of cost falling on the U.S. Now, the Iraqis could argue that we didn't ask the U.S. to come in and, and you know, topple Saddam Hussein as well. No, fair enough. I'm not saying that it's Iraq's fault. Uh, but I do think that if you're going to think about the future security architecture of the world, that to suppose that the U.S. can be the one that finances it at all without significant contributions from Germany or other prospering countries, that's mm -hmm. foolish. Well, let's get a call in from Juliana in Paris. Thanks for your patience, uh, Juliana. Go ahead, please. Yes, good evening, Mr. Khan. Good evening, hi. Hi, thank you. Uh, basically, I just wanted to find out, uh, just to ask that, I mean, weapons of mass destruction do not exist in Afghanistan as they finally discovered. And don't you think that uh, Bush's in, 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 in initiative, or rather motive, into Afghanistan was self-driven, as in just a, a thing of e egoistism. He was just an egoist in the fact that I think he's just a warmonger and it just perhaps... Um, what about the oil wells in Afghanistan? Was was it not what he was after, perhaps? Because look at how much deficit is going to be left behind, especially for the incoming president okay. to, to basically look at. And I believe that there was a better way to approach this um, yeah. weapon of mass destruction, so-called thing they wanted right. to discover, Juliana, in terms of dialogue. Uh, Ju Juliana, I'm going, to put yes. this, I'm going to put this to Professor Cole in London. Actually, uh, the reference is really to, I guess, the, the, the cost in Iraq more, more than Afghanistan here. But the, the issue, I guess, uh, is that weapons of mass destruction were never found in Iraq, have never been, have never surfaced and have been used to justify uh, the, the uh, invasion into Iraq. I wonder why no one has really been at high level has been held accountable for what seemed to be a lot of mistakes in, in uh, security intelligence and then ultimately action taken. Well, there hasn't been uh, a lot of accountability uh, across the board uh, uh, with this administration. There's been uh, no independent investigation, for example, uh, of the uh, torture uh, uh, allegations. The only investigations have been undertaken by the uh, military and by the Justice Department and by the CIA, all of which are implicated in the actual conduct that's, uh, that's at issue. Uh, this is not an administration that believes uh, terribly strongly in, in, in accountability. And no, no weapons of mass destruction were found. I think the, the real problem with the Iraq war, though, uh, was that it was a preventive war. That is, uh, we did not respond to a threat of an imminent attack, uh, as is required under international law. Uh, we went in uh, preventively, not even arguing that there was a threat of an imminent attack, but arguing that there might be these weapons of mass destruction and they might, uh, at some point in the future, give them to al-Qaeda, and al-Qaeda might then use them against us. Turns out there were none there. But the, the point is that under international law, a country should not unilaterally attack another country unless it has been attacked or it faces an imminent threat of attack. And we didn't face that. We went to the Security Council. We asked them to authorize our, our uh, efforts, notwithstanding the lack of an imminent threat. Uh, the Security Council said no. The world said no. And we went ahead and did it anyway. And, and I think, uh, you know, we, we've paid the, the consequences. Uh, Professor Wedgwood, if I may, I think Please, that I mean, dueling, dueling law professors, perhaps, <laughs> but but David is wildly overstating the, the the case in in the sense that in this peculiar situation, Saddam Hussein's legal duty under the resolution from the first Gulf War 
was to make plain and verifiable and certifiable that he had disarmed. And the cat and mouse game that he played for so long of, I have a card in my hand, guess what the number is? Oops, no card, uh, made it almost impossible for the UN Weapons Commission to, in fact, to verify that he had disarmed. Secondly, nobody has disputed that had he stayed in power, he would have reconstituted all of his programs of, of mass destruction. And third, uh, the sanctions that had been put in place to prevent him from doing so had, alas, alack, been crippled by the humanitarian exception that was carved out in the middle, which had been corrupted by Saddam in the oil for food program. Professor, with just a, a minute to go, but I the, want to put an email. The, uh, go ahead, uh, Professor Cole. The, the, the bottom line is that there were no weapons of mass destruction there, which meant that the inspections regime was working and the sanctions were working and that, in fact, Saddam Hussein did not pose the threat that we claimed he posed. And, 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 but, but had he remained that, in power? Critical point, the, critical point, the critical point is that you, know, had, you can, you can uh, s speculate all you want about what might have happened if, um, but the bottom line is there was nothing there uh, the, which suggests that the scheme in place, which did not involve aggressive war by one country against another country that had not attacked it, was working. Right. Uh, and was working without l loss of massive lives uh, within Iraq, which well, is what Professor we, uh, we visited upon that country. I'm sorry, but I have to stop you there. And Professor Wedgwood, I thank you too for thank being you. with us. Appreciate you both being here for this debate. Sorry we're out of time with that. And thank you for being with us. Send us your views on any pressing issues around the world. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.